Okay, so welcome to this uh, uh, Fujita Alumni Association webinar. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, today to have, of course, uh, Professor Yoko Kato, our mentor, uh, connected. Uh, I see also uh, Dr. Liu. Hello, Liu. And we have uh, uh, two uh, great speakers today for uh, this webinar who are gonna uh, talk about uh, very interesting topics actually. Uh, we have Professor uh, Kasper Eckehard and uh, uh, Dr. Iti Chai Sakurunchai. Uh, thank you for accepting our invitation and uh, uh, for being here. Uh, Professor uh, Yoko Kato, do you want to say some introductory words before I introduce the first speaker? Thank, thank you so much. I, I think uh, two uh, the very excellent topics are very much uh, interesting, and especially the Professor Kaspar is uh, my a good friend for many years. So we are very much expecting the most uh, your lectures. Thank you, Yoko. Thank you. So yes. So, uh, do you want to say something else, Professor? Yeah, I want to thank uh, Yoko for her really tireless efforts to bring young people around the same table and uh, invite uh, speakers to engage in a discussion. I think you have been a, a, a huge inspiration around the globe and your commitment is really a fantastic role model for all of us to get more engaged in education. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Professor uh, Kasper Eckehard. Uh, is a professor of surgery at McMaster University and uh, he's regional chief of neurosurgery for Stewart Medical Group and chair at the St. Elizabeth Boston with staff appointments at the Dana Farber Cancer Institute and Brigham and Women's Hospital. He uh, had a clinical neurosurgical training in Europe, uh, in particular in Germany and in the USA. Uh, and he also got a PhD in neurobiology at Oxford University. Uh, he is board certified neurosurgery, a neurosurgeon, and also is certified in neurocritical care for the US, Europe, and Canada. Uh, he has a, a strong academic uh, experience, uh, and his uh, main interests uh, are tumor surgery and. Uh, stereotactic radiosurgery. He published more than 200 papers uh, and many, uh, he had many editorial boards in the field. He is executive member uh, in uh, several associations like the uh, WFNS, A WNS, uh, ENS, Asian Congress, and he's founding member of uh, uh, IANA. So today, uh, Professor Eckehard will uh, uh, give his speech about the surgical management of olfactory groove meningiomas, a very uh, interesting topic. So thank you, Professor Eckehard, to be here. And uh, please, you can start uh, with your presentation. Thank you. Um... So I want to talk a little bit about the management of giant olfactory groove meningiomas. Um, it's a topic dear to my heart, and uh, it's actually one of the uh, topics I've tried to work on over the last 10 years, because my thoughts in this particular um, surgical approach have shifted quite a bit from training to uh, what I'm doing now, and I want to take you through this journey. Uh, I have no disclosures other than that I'm privileged and lucky to work in a number of uh, really wonderful institutions. Um, now to the topic. Um, meningiomas remain the most frequent primary brain neoplasms that we see in our uh, average practice. About one third of our patients in a mixed tumor center are really meningiomas. The female to male ratio remains about two to one with the peak in the fifth decade. Um, of those meningiomas, olfactory group meningiomas only make up about 10%. And as you all know, they grow in the anterior skull base, somewhere between the crista galli and the dorsum cellae. And hence their blood supply happens uh, usually via the anterior and posterior ethmoidal arteries, uh, the middle meningeal artery, and sometimes branches from the ACA and ACOM. Um, of those, the larger ones are termed giant olfactory groups meningiomas, and they're just defined as you know, having a diameter of roughly five by five by five centimeters in all dimensions. Um, distribution is the same, two thirds female, 
at a mean age of about 55 with a mean duration of two and a half years of symptoms before they come to the attention of the surgeon in this large series by Gazeri. Um, now, what is the clinical presentation? Well, due to the slow growth, they really have an insidious onset of symptoms which often leads to delay in diagnosis, but the symptoms are rather typical. It's usually a combination of anosmia and uh, initially dementia, um, which is really a frontal lobe syndrome, which can be either positive or negative symptoms. If they are negative, then patients are sort of withdrawn, lethargic, or appear depressed. If they are positive symptoms, patients can get uh, agitated, hallucinate, and often be diagnosed with psychosis. And then the typical other symptoms are headaches, uh, change in vision, sometimes seizures, and often frontal release signs such as urinary incontinence. Now, how often do these symptoms occur? Uh, very frequency in this large series by Henschel, you can see that 50% of patients have headaches, uh, two thirds of patients show a mental status change, about half of the patients have a change in vision, and uh, two thirds of patients have already lost their vision at their, their sense of smell at presentation, uh, which is important also in your counseling for surgical consent. Well, this delay in workup often actually leads to misdiagnoses. So many of these patients, because of their change in behavior, are initially classified as psychosis or glaucoma patients. Frequently patients are treated for headaches and sinusitis for years, um, sometimes even for stroke, or stress incontinence, and they're handed around sort of one primary care physician to the next without ever really looking into what's really happening. Um, and if you think about this, the preoperative mental changes really cover a lot of problems that we encounter, um, not just during COVID, but in general. And confusion is noted in 40% of patients, depression, one in four patients, apathy, one in five patients, and sort of not being in the right mood in one in five patients. So, uh, not very typical or specific here. And for that very reason, um, in the 50s, Zilke in Switzerland has already noted that these tumors are much more frequently encountered in mental hospitals than at autopsy. And I really think this should prompt us to a strategy of how we admit patients to psychiatry. I think nobody should ever be admitted to a psychiatric floor without a brain scan, because you may find a surprise uh, during workup. Now, the next other important point to remember is that the eye exam is uh, key here. You often find a combination of reduced vision, papillary edema, optic atrophy. How often does this happen? Visual acuity is compromised in 50% of patients. Visual field defect, one in five patients. Optic disc, uh, pallor and atrophy, in one in four patients. So not infrequently, infrequently and hence residents should really continue to look at the eyes as part of the neurological status exam. Now, <clears throat> what do we find in the eye exam? Well, because of the optic nerve is compressed uh, from above, from superiorly, the most frequent visual field effect that we see is inferior and can be unilateral. Um, in tuberculum cell meningiomas, that visual field effect is more temporal, um, and as you know, the same is true for pituitary adenoma. So that's a good differential. Also of note, the famous Foster Kennedy syndrome of unilateral optic nerve atrophy has been described in this patient population in olfactory groove meningiomas. So what should we do when we find these large lesions? Well, I think generally speaking, all large lesions of this type are surgical. Um, it's interesting to realize uh, more than 100 years ago, they took the first of these lesions out without microscope, without steroids, without ICU. And uh, this patient was described to survive for 12 years postoperatively. It's a phenomenal article to read. And I think uh, one should pay respect to our forefathers who established all this. In the pre-CT area, surgical mortality was very high, about 30%. Um, which has improved in current series to 1% to 10%. But the question really remains, what are good approaches here? So this is a management outline that I usually show to my residents. How do I manage uh, in my outpatient clinics or factory group meningiomas? If the lesion is small, is truly asymptomatic, and the patient is stable, there's really nothing to be done. If then the patient is followed uh, sequentially and the lesion is progressive on two sequential scans, the patient should be treated, and it usually is open surgery unless there's a contraindication. 
if the lesion is non-incidental and the patient is symptomatic, I think all patients are really surgical. Um, if the patient has a contraindication to surgery, you can still treat with SRS, and we've recently published a nice paper on that topic. Now, what is the best surgical approach for these lesions? If you want to read one article on the topic, this is the article of choice in my mind. Spectre from Israel has put together a fantastic series at that time where he takes you through all the advantages of a bifrontal approach, unilateral approach, terional approach, OZ approach, or subcranial approach. And I think uh, in 2005 already had a series of 80 cases, which has doubled by now. He is one of the uh, great surgeons in the field. It's really worthwhile reading this. What are determinants of surgery for OGM? Well, first you need to define your goal of resection. Do you uh, want to do a gross total resection at any cost, which I do not advocate for? Or is uh, it good to do a subtotal resection and maybe leave the hyperosseous portion behind? And in rare cases, do you just want to do a debulking? Key is the early interruption of the blood supply. Key is to achieve a non-traumatic separation of the frontal lobes from these tumors. You need to dissect off the ACA, the optic chiasm, and the optic nerves from the lesion. And you really, for that reason, need to have good visualization of the flow of the anterior cranial fossa. So what is a good approach? And the debate has been really going on for the last 100 years. And of course, Cushing is involved, as most of you know. He advocated a unilateral frontal approach and just take out the cortical wedge that is hanging over this particular area to get best access, which is probably well explained by his uh, need for vascular control, which was so unknown at that time. And he said that, uh, predicted that we would be able to operate on smaller tumors uh, if we get better imaging, which we do at this point. His great counterpart, Dandy, argued, no, you should take these lesions out bilaterally and uh, also take out the frontal cortex. Um, so the two giants in the field from the very beginning didn't really know what's the best. Well, in Europe, at the same time, uh, Oliver Kroner really said, um, yes, we can do a unilateral cortical wedge resection. And he followed sort of Cushing's idea. But he already picked up that uh, younger generations now will have a much more difficult time to uh, get enough experience with this because as neurosurgery emerged in more and more centers, there was less experience per center for those in training. Uh, so one needs to think about whether we should bundle this experience in a few centers that sees more of these uh, to really bundle the knowledge. Um, in Europe, um, there were more technical innovations. Tennis in Germany uh, came up with a bilateral frontal basal approach to really try to stay under the frontal lobes with the uh, resection of the forks and the superior sagittal sinus uh, to better preserve frontal brain tissue, which was picked up in the United States by Ogeman. And uh, the French uh, then pushed this further and said, why not come in from below the frontal lobes and do a transbasal approach, um, which is beyond the scope of this particular talk. Well, my personal experience here started really because I trained in an institution that was dominated by Ogeman. So, um, he trained many of the great surgeons in the United States. Uh, and, you know, when you see a big lesion like this, it makes sense to think about a midline bilateral frontal basal approach and to release the forks down here and uh, resect the frontal sinus because it really gives you optimal access. But it's a very large approach, as you can see. This is one of these lesions. I always obtain pre-surgical CTAs and CTV to see really the vascularity of the lesion and venous collaterals, which are to be preserved. I think everybody should have a formal ophthalmology examination and, if possible, formalized uh, psychiatric testing. Um, then, if you do these cases, you need to meticulously plan it. And I think uh, most of my patients receive my intraoperative cocktail for brain relaxation, which is really 100 grams of mannitol, 20 of Lasix, 10 of Decadron. And then I have a rule of 30. I hyperventilate the patient to a PCO2 of 30 elevate the bed to 30 degrees and make sure that the crit uh, always stays above 30 so the patient is safe. In addition, you really need to plan early for bilateral pericranial flap, which is nicely shown in this picture, because you may have to exenterate the frontal sinus, plan for an abdominal fat graft that you need to prep out, possibly a lumbar drain to get more relaxation and to then preserve your frontal sinus, you don't get a CSF leak post-op. Uh, key is also intraoperative image guidance to get the frontal sinus measures right. 
and venous pre preservation. Once you're done with the surgery, we'll come back to this in a second, I have a protocol that every patient uh, is imaged within four hours to get a CAT scan, to make sure that your bony alignment is perfect, that there's not too much air in the brain, and uh, I keep patients on hydrosteroids and seizure medications for the weeks to come. And the osteoplasty, so proper alignment of the bone, I think is absolutely key because patients have their forefront exposed. So you don't want to have a patient have a complication with their uh, most visible part of the face exposed. Well, how does this look? Well, initially, post op MRI scan on day one, you see a large resection cavity. You still have a lot of swelling of the frontal lobes which I think is not necessarily retractor related. It sometimes happens because you lose either a vein of the frontal basis at the capsule or um, because the tumor really has uh, blocked this outflow for a long time and it remains this way. Um, three months later, the brain has nicely recovered and filled the cavity, but your frontal lobe signal change often remains the same. And so do some of the psychiatric symptoms which uh, hang around. Well, my only roving thoughts then were, do we really have to make our approach this big? Because as much as it gives you optimal access and really nice viewing angles, you know, just need one patient in this domain who develops osteomyelitis or a bone flap infection. If they lose their entire forefront, it's a huge problem for the patient. And uh, I always wondered, can we do any better? And maybe um, big is not always beautiful. So I went back to the literature and really followed up what happened. And in, in Europe, Wolf Seeger, who trained many of the uh, chairmen that have trained us in the 80s, really described the approach that Cushing used. But he came up with the idea to say, why don't we do bilaterally a frontal approach and just leave the middle behind so you're not running into the problem of the frontal sinus? Well, he did this prior to CAT scan and MRI imaging was implemented. So he still encountered a reasonably high number of CSF leaks in 20% of his patients, but he really had uh, excellent surgical outcomes by hollowing the tumor out from both sides and then sort of just leaving the bridge in the middle. This was uh, further pushed by two of his disciples, uh, Hustler in Frankfurt and Zentner, uh, who said, well, maybe we can do this from one side alone, come out from one side and just resect the forks that is blocking your view to get over to the other side. And they recommended that if you come in from a terional approach, you can start posteriorly and decompress the vessels and then swing anteriorly and basically take this tumor out step by step. And they had very good success with this. The problem is that I think if you start posteriorly, you operate against the blood supply coming in from the ethmoidals. So I personally didn't like this very much. And I also felt they were too aggressive in drilling out from one side, the hyperostotic skull base, which then causes again your CSF leak or you have difficulties controlling the extent of resection. So um, that made me think. Um, I read a little bit more about Sami's approach, uh, Nakamura's approach to use really minimal invasive frontal lateral approaches or even eyebrow approaches. So when you read about this, you realize the terional approach is really great because you can uh, easily get access to the optic apparatus and the vessels, but subfrontal is actually nice because it access, accesses the frontal vasculature more easily, and hence you can devascularize the tumor earlier and resect it. So I thought, why not combine the two? And this is really my first line approach. I combine a unilateral terional approach with a frontal lateral or subfrontal approach even in very large tumors. And I come in in the side where more than 50% of the tumor is located. So this one was a large uh, factory groove meningioma. I wanted to approach from the right. As I said before, I always get MRI, DSA, and CTA. And you want to notice that the patient has big vascular supply, almost like a volcano pumping in from below. You want to um, look at your ACAs, which are draped over the back end of the tumor here. And you want to make sure you understand where is the tumor calcified because that's the hard part of the tumor to get to at the end. And uh, that helps you for your surgical planning, also for time and expectations. Again, I usually get uh, CT scans pre-op and actually scout images will show you the frontal sinus nicely. And in combination with image guidance, you want to bring your opening as low as possible for best possible viewing angle. So these are my pearls. I think you should really use um, an osteotomy that goes right to the midline and you just stop short of the sinus. You should bring osteotomy down 
uh, within five millimeters to the frontal sinus, but not open the frontal sinus, so you won't have a CSF leak. And laterally, you use the terional approach and drill down the orbital roof, as well as the edge here of the keyhole, because that allows you perfect viewing under the tumor, which helps you with best control. That's what I did in even this very large lesion. And as you can see, we got a perfect cross total resection with the exception of I do not drill out anymore the hyperostotic bone in the crib reform plate. I always get uh, DWIs day one and we had no strokes associated with this technique. And I have to tell you, I haven't had any strokes since if I'm diligent and uh, timely in my approach. Now, what does the literature say? Well, it's a mixed bag. Gross total resection is reported in 60 to 100 percent, but it depends on what you define as gross total resection, whether you include, include the bone or not. Clinical improvement is reported in you know, more than 50, definitely 60 to 100 percent of patients, but results differ based on the extent of surgery performed. So if you just check at minimal status examination and you want to see how patients do, um, here, a series of 25 patients that were tested where only six were preoperatively normal. You get a huge improvement in mental status in the majority of patients. And the score improves from you know, half of what uh, the test allows you to do to you know, a score above 85%. And um, visual function also improves in more than 25% uh, of these patients. Here, a large series again from Henschel that I had mentioned before. They reported 98% gross total resection of the soft portion of the tumor, 100% of their patients improved mentally, 90% of their patients improved uh, in, with respect to their vision. So very smart approach, unilateral removal of a bilateral tumor. Now the patient is more interested in the risk than he's interested in the gross total resection rates. And the risks remain the same, they're not very different from any other surgical approaches. I think what we as a specialty need to define is how do we report complications to make it comparable between different series and different surgical techniques. My go-to paper is this paper by Grondin in 2007 that complica um, classifies complication into major and minor, major complications leading to a permanent neurological deficit or some major, major troubles minor complications really just leading to a transient neurological deficit. Please pull up this paper from Gronda in 2007 that was written on uh, colloid cysts. It's a beautiful paper in defining complications. And I'm on the World Federation Committee for Complications with Kiki Turel. We are trying to bring this uh, into the discussion to standardize how we are going to report this in the future. Now, complications occur in every hand, even the best of uh, surgical hands. What are typical numbers? Currently, CSF rates are reported still around 5.5%, depending on your technique. And um, the overall um, complication rate in larger series, this is a pool series again from Henschel, was about 8% if you combine seizures, infarcts, infections, and CSF leaks altogether. So not a entirely benign procedure, but given the lack of alternative, you know, a relatively low rate. And I always tell my patients when I walk in for consent, please be reassured your success uh, chance is more than 90%. So I want them to not be afraid. And then later on, you can help them understand what's left uh, to be avoided. Now, what are more recent debates? Um, well, it's increasingly um, debated whether endoscopic approaches should be used also for those lesions. In my personal opinion, to take out a five centimeter tumor through the nose and having a CSF leak rate of, you know, 20% or 10% is not worth an eight hour operation. This can be removed very safely, very um, well through a standard microsurgical approach. So I think olfactory groove meningiomas also because of your viewing angle, because it's very steep, are not the tumors to go for in endoscopy. But there was a paper out there in uh, 2015 that reported less frontal lobe swelling and signal change after endoscopic removement, which makes sense. If some people use stationary attractors and pull a lot, you get some more signal change if you come in from above. Whether this translates into any meaningful clinical outcome remains to be seen. Charles Theo, one of my friends uh, from Australia, always advocates you can take all this out endoscopically 
but also he cautions you that whereas tuberculum cell meningiomas posteriorly have a reasonable working approach, it's really hard to get the angle right to take out an olfactory groove meningioma. And even for endoscopic assisted microsurgery, if you look over the eyebrow, you may not be able to look down in the valley of the olfactory bulbs. So I think microsurgery remains the go-to approach for this particular problem. And as I mentioned, SRS remains a backup option for those patients unfit for surgery. Now, just my very final slide, because as it happens, I have to do one of these cases tomorrow. This young man came in, very unusual presentation at age 22. I think this is an olfactory groove meningioma, although it has some central necrosis. So it could be a different pathology. The um, tumor shows that the ACAs are displaced posteriorly. And you can see that nicely in our CDA. You can see the vascular supply in this tumor largely is from the ethmoidals actually going here through the skull base and creating sort of volcano supply from underneath. The um, T2 signal changes are already extensive in both frontal lobes, but you have a nice T2 cleft around the tumor that allows you to resect this safely from the separation from the frontal lobes. And I hope to accomplish this tomorrow after the patient will go undergo embolization today because there was a huge amount of blood supply on the CT perfusion studies, where you can see that the patient has dense vascular supply. Of note, this is the first time I've ever seen a very large crystal gully that has an air cell in it connected to the frontal lobe. So different from what the literature says, that in a unilateral approach, you can take out the crystal gully to reach the contralateral yeah. tumor. I'm not going to do it in this lesion, because I think I may create a CSF leak through this pathway. I will come in with a mini approach from the opposite side to take this tube out. So this was it from my perspective. Thank you very much for letting me give you this presentation and thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Professor, for this uh, very nice presentation about uh, uh, olfactory groove meningiomas. Uh, I want to welcome also my co-moderator, uh, Professor Bishnoi, who just joined us. Hello, Ishu. <laughs> Uh, and I would like to ask uh, if there are questions from the audience. Uh, okay, I see uh, Dr. Dragan Jankovic. Hello, Dragan. Uh, yes, 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 okay. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for a great uh, lecture and I had to great uh, Professor Cato, uh, Feletti and other colleagues. Um, I had uh, one question or comment. You said that um, you always do uh, preoperative CTA uh ophthalmological examination and physiological test do you do as a standard um ophthalmological uh, ophthalmological examination post-operative or just in case of a new deficit no actually i do it for all patients pre and post-op in the united mm. states it's uh, really important that visual field tests are documented in patients uh, should not be driving afterwards if the visual field defect remains permanent. And I have no kind question. Can sure. I? Okay, uh, so uh, we know that olfactory groove meningioma impact preoperative uh, cortex cognitive functions. Uh, and um, the recent studies said, I think from uh, 2021, that um, after initial postoperative worsening, uh, can after come after one year to to uh, cognitive flexibility and attention improving. Um, uh, I have question um, in in follow up. Do you do also physiological test after one year, three months, so, six months? Yeah, I've just switched hospitals and I now have a neuropsychologist uh, who wants to see these patients with me three months and a year later. Um, so I really want to look at this in more detail, but one thing you need to remember is we are a little bit unfortunate that sort of two pathologies cross, right? Since this, this tumor happens more in the elderly, we see more and more older patients that have a neurological decline to begin with. And even if you improve the patient post-op and they get significantly better, some patients show a post-operative neurological decline either from underlying Parkinson's, dementia, or you know, other medical comorbidities. And we need to still figure out, um, does this really apply to this population? 
since the mean time of presentation is in the mid 50s for most meningiomas, and I'd say the big ones maybe show up in the late 60s, right? One needs to just be aware of the fact that there's more medical comorbidity, so we need to study this more carefully, but I think the benefit is pretty obvious. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. So, Casper, thank you very much for your great lecture, as always. So, just I want to know, because you mentioned in your lecture, so endoscopic resection. So, uh, do you have any limitation of the endoscopic uh, removal of the tumor, please? Well, I have spoken uh, to Vladimir Benesh a lot from Prague. You know, he tried also to take these out through the nose at the beginning, and one of my staff members in Canada Cash Reddy has uh, done big meningiomas from the frontal skull base, which I think, yes, it is feasible. Um, and uh, some patients feel they don't want to have a bifrontal scar in any way. But if you think about it, the term minimal invasive should really not be applied to whether you see a skin scar or not. For me, minimal invasive as an approach uh, means you have minimal morbidity in whatever approach you pick. And to do a keyhole approach for a tumor the size of my fist just is not intuitive and I think makes little sense, especially if these meningiomas are attached to the undersurface of the frontal lobe and have vascular supply that may possibly be stuck to the backside of the tumor. So peeling this out from the nose and pulling on all this, uh, for me, is just not intuitive. I think there are some gifted people that have done good operations endoscopically maybe for a smaller tumor, three centimeters in size that is growing two centimeters, right? I would, I would respect that, but I think they are classic microsurgical lesions for a supratentorial approach. And I really wanna push this into the hands of the younger ones. Not everything that sounds fashionable and minimal invasive is good for the patient. If you have a CSF leak rate in the, the skull base of 10%, 15%, that is a devastating complication because you can't do anything if your brain is constantly running out of uh, fluid, right? So doing this from the top down and in good hands, this has a CSF leak rate of 2% if you don't drill out the frontal skull base. I think that's the way to go. Thank you, Professor. I also have a few questions if uh, uh, there are sure. no other questions from the audience. So you mentioned about the, the patient you are gonna operate tomorrow. Uh, about uh, preoperative embolization. So I, I would like to know how often do you use uh, preoperative embolization for these kind of, uh, uh, of tumors and the timing uh, to perform uh, this embolization? So it's actually rare that I do uh, require pre-surgical embolization. Um, I would say out of you know 50 cases that I've done, I've done maybe five times pre-surgical embolization. So 10% of my cases based on the CTA. If you see, there's an enormous gush on the CTA and it's difficult to get to that lesion for anatomical reasons. There's calcification above it or you know, just the viewing angle is hard. I think an embolization is an elegant way to make you operate in the dry tumor. So, sorry. No problem. That's my, um, need to shut this down one second. Sorry, sorry, one second. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Let's see how this if you, if you have to reply, please. We okay. don't know anyone to get hurt uh, at your hospital <laughs> as your uncle. <laughs> I think I had set myself a warning timer that I'm not talking too much. <laughs> <laughs> so pre-surgical embolization needs to happen within 48 hours prior to surgery, but I actually think much closer is better. 12 hours time window between embolization and taking the tumor out is a good time frame because once the tumor is shut down they will swell and you have to be really right. careful if there already is tightness in the frontal lobe the patient doesn't have a lot of room so today i'm going to get this patient embolized in the morning i put him in the icu afterwards i will probably dry him out a little bit with you know three percent normal saline to just uh, keep the brain relaxed and then um, depending on how late they finish the embolization, I could do it this evening, but you know, it's a big operation. You don't want to start it after 6 p.m. So I do it tomorrow morning first thing. So that's what I'm trying to do. Thank you. 
And uh, also, if I uh, can ask a couple of more questions. Uh, um, the first one is uh, about uh, actually brain swelling, post-operative brain swelling. Uh, I have a, I remember a couple of cases we have done in the uh, past years, very big tumors. Um, everything was fine during the operation and uh, we basically uh, didn't sacrifice any uh, vessel, any major vessel, uh, also the venous one. Uh, but in this couple of patients, uh, uh, after the, the, the operation in the following weeks, uh, they, in, they, their condition was impaired. Um, I mean, consciousness uh, was getting uh, bad and uh, CT scan showed uh, uh, impressive uh, brain edema, uh, probably from a venous problem, I guess. So I would like to uh, know your experience about this kind of complication, which is uh, actually temporary because uh, they, they can re they recover, uh, but after weeks uh, in our yeah. experience. And the second question is about uh, some recent papers uh, on olfactory groove meningiomas, uh, talking about the possibility for olfactory nerve sparing in this surgery. Uh, what do you think about this? Because I think it's not so easy, at least in my hands. Thank you. So um, olfactory nerve sparing is the simpler question. I think if you do unilateral approach, you have a chance to save the contralateral nerve. That's my rule of thumb. And that's when two thirds of the tumor are on the right side, you know, there's less pressure on the left side. So it makes sense that if you have to sacrifice one of them, take out the one that with the majority of the tumor is stuck to, um, but try to save the other one because not smelling is actually a pretty devastating side effect that just changes their quality of life. Um, but yes, you're right. A lot of these tumors are very baked to the nerve and it is not easy to peel this off unless you leave a portion of the tumor, maybe the tumor shell behind on the side where you want to save it. So I do think um, it is possible to do olfactory nerve preservation with a supratentorial approach better than an endoscopic approach. Although uh, Charles Theo claims he has done unilateral transnasal approaches and still preserved smell on the opposite side. Um, I'm going to visit him and we want to talk this through. I want to see these cases because uh, I think there must be some anatomical variant that allows you to do it. Um, I think nerve sparing is possible. There's a paper by Vladimir Benesch, I think, in European skull base surgery from last year that shows in about you know one third to half of the patients that can be accomplished. I don't really remember whether the cross total resection rate was the same. Um, but if someone is 75, maybe a gross total resection is not necessary, right? You can think about leaving a sliver of tumor on that nerve because that patient may never see the recurrence to be big, big enough to become a problem. And you can also postoperatively irradiate it. So that part, I think one should just individualize. If you have a good chance to save it, give it a try. If it can't be done, that's the one complication I tell the patient up front is likely to happen, although I try to make it not happen, right? So it's a hard call. The other question about brain swelling, I think has to do with how you use retractors. People still claim stationary retractors are bad. And I would agree if you put a, a flat retractor for six hours on the brain, you know, it's hard if you put pressure there, you get venous stasis, venous outflow obstruction, maybe venous thrombosis, so you didn't lose the vessel physically, but the vessel is not draining, right? So maybe that's part of the complication. So I keep my patients quite well hydrated. I mean, I make them dry for a moment when I open, but then I keep them total body balance even. And in the ICU blood pressure supply, I drive the pressure up a little bit to make sure that they're actually well perfused. Um, and I don't sacrifice any surface veins. That's why I do not do a cortical wedge resection anymore. I want to preserve as many of the surface veins as well as the ones going towards the midline, if I can do so. Um, and you're right, some patients will show a spontaneous thrombosis of a vein draining the capsule or next to it. And then you need to develop collaterals. And a few weeks later, the problem is gone because the brain is draining the other direction. But for a short while, you may 
you may run into this problem. Um, I can't be more specific. I think it very much depends on the patient's anatomy. But if you get a pre-surgical CTA, you may as well get a CTV, which tells you really what vessel you must preserve. Thank you, Professor. Is there any other question from the audience? So if not, we might uh, uh, move on with the second uh, uh, speaker. I, I would like to ask uh, Professor Ishu Bishnoi to take the floor for the second speech. Thank you. Thank you, dear Alberto. Uh, sorry, I, I was late. I was busy in case and I reached late. Uh, second speaker will be Dr. Itichai Sakurai, his dear friend. And uh, he is currently working as assistant professor at Takshin Hospital, Bangkok. He did his neurosurgery from Prince Songkala Hospital, Songkla, Thailand, and then did fellowship from Fujita Health University, Nagoya, and uh, cerebrovascular uh, fellowship from Hokkaido, Japan. And he passed planet exam for neurosurgery. And he also did a neuroradiology fellowship from Shri Raj Hospital, Bangkok. Currently, he is also a reviewer of uh, Asian uh, Congress of Neurosurgical Journal. And uh, he will be speaking on uh, role of embolization for chronic subdural hematoma. So I would like to invite Dr. Iti Chai to present his presentation. Thank you. Thank you for Fushan alumni that invite me to, to talk uh, some topics for today. And uh, today I, I will talk about uh, the topic that uh, maybe this is a new paradigm in the future. Uh, that is the alternative treatment of the chronic subdural hematoma. Because of the chronic subdural hematoma is a major issue in uh, our career in neurosurgery because uh, we have a lot of cases of the chronic subdural hematoma and uh, it has many problems after we face up like in this case. Today I will talk uh, the uh, technical effectiveness to treat by endovascular treatment. Maybe in, in this treatment, maybe in, uh, it's the future trend uh, to treatment because this is uh, in, uh, minimally invasive surgery. Okay, for the chronic subdural hematoma, uh, as we know, the etiology is a uh, the rupture of the breathing vein at the uh, subdural stage. But uh, for the capsule of uh, subdural hematoma, uh, is composed of the capillary uh, rare, rare in about the broader zone rare. This is the cause of a loss of inflammatory process. Uh, that this is the reason why uh, after we surgery, why many people has uh, uh, the incident of recurrent of chronic subdural hematoma because uh, uh, the role of inflammatory process that's cause of rebuilding in the capsule of the chronic subdural hematoma. Now we believe in this theory, maybe healthy a lot to treatment in this condition. Uh, for this condition, uh, this is an increasing uh, incident for the older age patient because they have uh, many uh, factors like uh, the different brain atrophy or the use of the uh, anti coagulant or anti parrot and uh, have a uh, minor head trauma. Be because in, in this disease, if we, we cannot treat like uh, adequately, maybe uh, in this condition is make the patient like increase morbidity, morbidity and need resurgery. And this is uh, the, the uh, common problems that we should reply for uh, uh, cardiologists or vascular surgeon that they need to resume the anti coagulant after the patient face of the chronic subdural hematoma. Uh, they uh, always are asked uh, when we should start the anti grant, but we don't have like, uh, the exact uh, answer to them. For the current study, uh, we focus uh, on the uh, radiology, microscopy, and molecular biology related chronic subdural hematoma and uh, uh, many other 
purpose about the target that should be like uh, in the in primary, like uh, give some dexamethasol to decrease the size of chronic subdural hematoma or uh, tansamic uh, acid or angiogenesis uh, factor. But uh, for the target therapy now, we uh, uh, didn't have uh, the, some consensus, uh, which is the optimized way that we should uh, treat uh, in this condition. Now we, uh, I will talk about the relationship between middle mental artery to supply the chronic subdural hematoma capsule. Uh, we can see this is uh, the middle mental artery. Uh, this vessel is a majority to supply about the dura, but the dura uh, in this rare, this is attached about the uh, subdural state. So in this patient, uh, this is represent of the uh, dura bus supply to the capsule of the mantis state uh, of chronic subdural hematoma, like in this case. However, uh, middle mental artery is, has uh, uh, anatomosis to another vessel, especially to ophthalmic artery and the inter uh, in internal carotid artery. Uh, in, in, in this artery, middle mental artery is uh, very dangerous when uh, we have uh, embolized in this vessel because uh, the embryonic material can cross to the ophthalmic artery and uh, it can occlude to the uh, internal carotid artery right in this picture. Uh, I can show in this uh, angiography of the uh, middle mental artery. You can see this, is, uh, this vessel can supply uh, the ophthalmic artery around the orbit area. And they have um, uh, uh, several bands that can anatomosis to the White House structure. Like in this case, because uh, uh, in normal population, we have around uh, 0 0.5 to 2 percent that uh, middle mental artery can supply about the orbit. We call uh, this uh, condition is meningeal ophthalmic variance. Uh, when, uh, when we inject the middle mental artery, you can see about the corridor bashing around here. That means in this patient, the ophthalmic artery uh, doesn't supply about the orbit area, but the meningeal, uh, middle meningeal artery can take care about the orbit structure. In this case, we cannot embolize for safety uh, to treat about the uh, chronic subdural hematoma. For another uh, concern, uh, because the middle mitral artery is a uh, run, uh, run through the forming spinosum. At the, uh, around this area, they have uh, some brand, like a pre brand. brand. In, in this region, they have the, uh, the, uh, uh, the brand, the vessel brand to supply the seven nerve. If in this area was embolized, Maybe the patient can uh, have about the facial palsy after embryization. How we know which the area to supply the facial nerve? When we see the angiography in the AP view, uh, this is the acute turn of the mitral mitral artery. In this area, we can uh, we know this is uh, the forming spinal zoom and the brand to supply the dura can uh, take off to supply at like a, uh, this will supply as a convexity line like this. For the lateral uh, view, we can see in this uh, area, the p touch branch to supply the facial nerve uh, arise from in this area. In this area, it's very dangerous to embolize because this it, it can cause a facial palsy. We call in this area is facial arcade. Like in this uh, imaging, if we embolize beyond this line, this is a safety. 
So the complication of middle meningeal artery embolization is can cause the blindness because anatomosis to autonomic artery. We can cause a, it can cause a stroke because anatomosis to inter, internal carotid artery or the half uh, destroy about the facial arcade to cause of facial palsy. How about the embolic material that I, I showed? Uh, now uh, they have uh, the commercial uh, embryonic material we call the particle. This is in, in the market. We, we, we can uh, see about the most company there are uh, provided in this material. Uh, about the cost, in, in, in my country, we, uh, the, the cost of embryonic material is around 160 US dollar. And we choose uh, about the size of the particle, uh, like a more than 80 micron, because uh, the smallest vessel that we can see on the angiography is around 80 micron. If we use another particle that uh, uh, the size is less than 80, uh, 80 micron is can cross to anatomosis to autonomic artery or the inter internal carotid artery. How about the advantage of the, uh, the particle that we can call the PVA? The PVA is uh, uh, referred to the polyvinyl alcohol particle because it's very safety, uh, because the size of the particle is very large, so it cannot go to the uh, uh, anatomosis. And if any user, it's uh, easy to prepare and it's cause of risk or necrosis of the skin once we inject. And uh, it's compatibility, uh, compatibility is uh, with a universal microcatheter and very uh, short time for embryonization. For the microcatheter and micro Y, I, uh, the total cost that is the cheapest cost is around 450 US dollar. For the based on my own experience, I not prefer for the uh, liquid embryonic material because it's very expensive and it's a uh, penetrate to uh, dendrite anatomosis. I just use only the particle. It's really easy and really short time and cheaper. How about the uh, indication for treatment in the chronic subdural hematoma? I just uh, treat as prophylactic and uh, adjunct the surgical evacuation. I, I choose only the patient have asymptomatic chronic subdural hematoma to treat this one or uh, post-surgical treatment or the recurrent of the patient. I can shoot for treat this one or the patient have some uh, concomitant anti or anti that's uh, is the contraindication for surgery. I just treat in this technique instead because it's not need to open surgery. And the submission have uh, comorbid disease, like a interrate long time for surgery and uh, need some submission needs to resume the anti anti grant after surgery immediately. So in this technique, it's not need uh, to, uh, to off this medication for long time. What is the uh, equation for treatment? If the patient have some neurological deficits or the presence of the increased intracranial pressure and need urgent surgical evacuation, I, I didn't uh, choose in this technique because in this patient need to uh, surgery first, or the patient have uh, the dangerous anatomosis on the angiography, like uh, anatomosis to the orbit or anatomosis to the internal cavity artery, I uh, exclude in this patient. How about the protocol? As the first one, I study about the common case artery because I want to see about the, uh, uh, cause of the internal carotid artery, the ophthalmic artery, and the side of the middle meningeal artery. This one, this is the ophthalmic artery, and this is the cause of intracranial vessel. For the second step, I uh, performed the selective external carotid artery study because I want to see 
what is the cost of the middle mitral artery? You can see in this one to supply about the dura. For the step three, I have uh, uh, do a low mouth because I want to uh, advance the microcatheter in the middle mitral artery in this cause. And step four, I inject the contrast uh, through the microcatheter. You can see about the the dural blood supply that correlated with the chronic subdural hematoma. And we can check in about the dangerous anatomosis to the ophthalmic artery or the internal catheter artery. Like in this case, uh, there is no anatomosis to, to a dangerous area. For the step five, I use the particle to embolize around, around that vessel. And the step six, uh, I have a retrograde embolization and uh, beyond the uh, foramen spinal zoom because we want to spare about the facial arcade. And the finally, for post embolization, I want to see about uh, the uh, MMA. In this case, this is MMA uh, was gone after embolization and the ophthalmic, uh, the uh, intracranial vessel is still patent. For the outcome, I uh, follow up CT scan of the brain after immunization around three weeks, one month or three months. And uh, uh, for about uh, the uh, neurological outcome after treatment, including the complication after immunization. For example, in this case, the patient, uh, 82 years old male, uh, he has uh, the uh, a triple air and uh, poor treatment with EWA for three weeks, and the patient still on the anti crack grant, warfarin, and they have uh, the high, uh, the optimal level of the warfarin. But the he present of uh, the headache. This is uh, the uh, EWA after treatment. Uh, we can see the coronary subdural hematoma in the left side. At that time, we, uh, because the patient has uh, the severe headache, we just write a collect uh, the warfarin, then uh, took the patient to the operation room. Uh, we uh, performed the burrow hole with irrigation and drainage. After one week, uh, we can see like a uh, uh, the collection of the, the subdural hematoma, and we just wait and see. After that, uh, after one month ago, we can see the recurrence of uh, subdural hematoma in the same side after surgery. And we, we need to, to wait because the patient have a high risk. And uh, uh, if we, we early the surgery, maybe the patient have uh, like a some complication. We just wait for three months. This is still stable of residual uh, subdural hematoma. But the vascular surgeon asks, asks me, how, what is the time we should res resume the anti grant as soon as possible because uh, the device uh, uh, for EWAR maybe will have some problems. I decided to treatment by evaluation for prevention in the future because I, 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 I need to resume the anti grant at the time in this uh, angiography show the middle mental artery. This is uh, for after embolization. It's the middle, uh, middle mental artery has gone like this way. This is a, uh, the view of super selection. You can see uh, this vessel supply the dura matter. This is the post embolization. After embolization, I order to resume anti grant stat. And uh, we follow about the treatment radar. It's a completely gone of the coronary subdural hematoma at the left side. For the second case, 
This is the male SSTK saw underlying with DM hypertension and lymphoma. The patient has a history of uh, minor head trauma for one month ago and present with headache. You can see like a small collection of the subdural spade in the left side. And we follow up. Uh, the hematoma is progression. It's a half uh, the larger size when we follow up and this change like a dense, uh, uh, more density on the CT scan, we can have, uh, see the multi-state of capsule of the chronic subdural hematoma after follow-up. At the time, because the patient had very old and uh, I don't, uh, uh, I, I just like to perform the surgery like uh, in, in this, uh, Age because I have many complications for long times. Uh, for from uh, if once we take the patient to surgery, I decided to perform the MMA MRI session. This is a picture after MRI session, and the patient have follow up uh, for for three months. Uh, direct uh, chronic subdural hematoma uh, has gone. This is for an, another case. It's a male, I think 67 years old. There, uh, he presented with alteration of consciousness with left hemiparesis. The CT scan show about the chronic subdural hematoma at the right side, cause uh, the midband shift to the left. The patient uh, was taken to the operation room because they have uh, echidna care pressure symptom. But uh, this is CT scan of the one day post of surgery. You can see they have uh, improved of uh, uh, the brain's uh, swelling and uh, small residue of coronary subdural hematoma. But uh, once we follow up at one month, you can see the progression at the surgical site. So the patient in this time uh, he's still good, but uh, uh, he concerned about in the future if uh, this site have a progression, maybe uh, he need to second surgery. I decided to uh, perform the MMA MRI session at the right side. Like in, in this one, this is the tip of the Michael Carter. It's a now now we get to the distal band of the middle mental artery. And uh, the MMA was embraced. We follow up for the three weeks that decreased size of the chronic subdural hematoma. And the second month they had like a, a almost complete uh, of a chronic, uh, completely gone of the chronic subdural hematoma at the right side. This is for another case. This is uh, 60 years old male uh, underlying with uh, ischemic stroke and uh, neurologist uh, prescribed about the uh, uh, copidogel and aspirin. But the patient uh, presented with headache without neurological deficits. At the time, we, we, have, uh, we, we have seen about the chronic uh, subdural hematoma at the left side. Due, uh, regarding two in this patient have this, uh, the symptom of increased nacrine pressure. Uh, we perform the burrow with drainage of the left side. Five days later, they have contralateral side of the chronic subdural hematoma. At that time, we just uh, MRI in this patient uh, because of uh, we uh, need to treat like a prophylactic in the right side because the patient need to resume the oral uh, anti uh, anti pellet because uh, the active of uh, ischemic stroke. At that time, we just uh, perform in the right side for MMA embolization. This one just embry in this area. This is a port embolization. And the oxalic acid is still patent once we run on the 
ICA. For three weeks later, you can see after resume an anti palette, after that, uh, uh, the right subdural hematoma completely gone. That in light imaging. In like this case, the, the male 66 years old developed for bilateral chronic subdural hematoma and present with a uh, headache, and the patient still uh, uh, on the copido grill. We perform the boho with irrigation. But uh, we need to uh, like uh, wait and see after operation, but they uh, have re accommodate about the chronic subdural hematoma for two weeks later. And the patient developed a progressive headache. At the time, uh, because the patient still like uh, doing well, but companion only headache, so we uh, have a time to uh, uh, want to follow up after embarrassation. We perform the right embarrassation at the time, a three week follow up, you can see the, the uh, smaller size of the light side that we perform embolization. Like this, it for three months, the patient uh, uh, clinical condition after follow up is very well. He can walk and no headache. In this patient, also, they have a lot. Uh, chronic subdural hematoma with acute on top, but recently bleeding. After we uh, perform the hole with drainage in the right side, for one month later, they had a contralateral side subdural hematoma, uh, and they still have uh, the smaller side in the right, right side also. At the time we perform uh, uh, embarrassation, but in the right side, you can see middle mental artery in this side supply to the orbit. So this, this side, we should not embolize because it can cause of blindness after embolization. We cannot do it right in right side, but we did it in the left side for embolization. And for the post embolization for one month, we can see very uh, clearly for uh, uh, disappear of the bilateral chronic subdural hematoma. In this case, uh, the patient on the warfarin after minor head trauma, so the scan is normal. But for three weeks after trauma, you can see that have the new region of the uh, chronic uh, of the subdural spate, and CT scan show. After five weeks, uh, they have like a, a the blood uh, accumulate in the subdural spate, both sides. We perform the bird hole with irrigation, both sides. But uh, six weeks later, they have a recurrent. We treatment with a uh, middle artery embolization for both sides. This is a uh, post MRI session, but in this case, we still uh, follow up. But the patient, uh, the critical condition of the patient is very well. Now in my series for treatment, right in this technique is uh, uh, allow 45 cases, but uh, there was uh, no chronic subdural hematoma recurrent after six months, except at the last case. Every case have full recovery, no symptom of headache, and able to continue of uh, the medication, and no complication related procedure. For the future study, uh, because uh, uh, the CT scan on the angiography suit, we can perform the fat panel detector CT scan. We can see like a membrane patchy enhancement. If we can see uh, the uh, CT on the CT scan like this, that means uh, in, in this case, it's very useful to uh, embolize to prevent about the uh, progressive of uh, coronary subdural hematoma. And we can uh, study about the 
if they have bilateral chronic subdural he uh, hematoma, we can uh, only select on the one side. And uh, if uh, they have anatomosis to another side, we can MRI session only one side to uh, uh, increase the if the uh, contralateral side uh, for MRI session in one time. For conclusion, uh, for treatment, for in this treatment is a can be a new practice guideline for alternative treatment for the recurrent of chronic subdural hematoma. But I recommend if the patient uh, present with acute increased intracranial pressure from this region, we should uh, uh, bring the patient to the operation room for uh, drainage first. After that, if the patient uh, have uh, some recurrent, we should uh, we can use this technique to prevent for reoperation. The, uh, this technique has the benefits for the elderly patient or the patient has uh, uh, the concomitant and anti coagulant or anti pellet medication because in this technique uh, does need to stop in this medication. Uh, and the cost of this treatment in my country is uh, allow 60 uh, 100 US dollar for, uh, from one poster uh, using with the particle MRI section. But I think uh, in, in this technique is uh, not too much expensive and very uh, useful in the, uh, some patients have the limitation for re-surgery. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tichai. It yes. was a, a wonderful presentation and uh, the concept was new. So I would like to ask audiences if they have any questions, please ask. So if I may ask. Okay, can so- you, Can you close your slides, please? Yes. So Iti, thank you very much for your uh, nice presentation. Um, also at my institution, we are starting with this, uh, uh, with this kind of procedure uh, for chronic subdurals. Uh, results are really impressive. Um, before my question, I would like to welcome, I see also uh, Adi, uh, and I noticed uh, also some of the students, medical students in Sarajevo, I had the privilege to meet last week. So I encourage them to uh, ask questions uh, also through uh, the chat. Um, um, Itich, I, uh, I followed your presentation and yeah, it's very exciting. Um, well, probably uh, residents in neurosurgery will not be happy because uh, they are gonna operate less cases. Uh, as we know, <laughs> chronic subdurals are usually uh, one of the first operations they perform. Anyway, uh, you said that there are specific indications for this uh, embolization. Um, of course, if there are major symptoms, uh, uh, you said uh, go for surgery. Uh, but this kind of operation, this kind of pr procedure requires time to uh, actually see the results. Results are excellent, but they are not immediate. So. Uh, how do you manage those cases uh, which are in between uh, no symptoms and major symptoms, like, uh, you know, uh, mild symptoms? Uh, how do you uh, manage those patients? Uh, uh, it's also important to talk with them. Maybe they have to accept to not to be right uh, uh, perfectly healthy for a while. I mean, how do you manage those cases? I just want to say one word. I just want to say thank you all for this beautiful platform. This was a fantastic presentation, Iti Chai. Thank you so much for having me. I need to run away. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Professor. Thank you very much for your presentation. Yeah. Uh, for, for your question, uh, in my clinical practice guideline, it's very really difficult to uh, categorize uh, uh, which the patient should receive in this training, but that I, I mentioned before, if the patient have uh, any symptom of the uh, increased intracranial pressure, like a uh, not full uh, gastrocoma score, or the patient have like a very severe headache, so I just uh, 
recommend in this technique for alternative treatment or the adjunct treatment is not primary treatment, but the patient have uh, like a minor headache or no neurological deficits and can to tolerate the pain and the CT scan, like uh, it's not too much for midline shift of the CT scan. I just like uh, talk with them, talk with the patient and leader chief. If you, you, you uh, use the techniques, maybe you can wait for at least three weeks to uh, have uh, like a, to see the effects of the embolization. It's not immediately. And uh, I also discussed with uh, another doctor that they have like uh, uh, involved some coexisting disease of the patient like they have a need to uh, take, resume some medication like an anticoagulant, like a, as soon as possible. I just like a, I discuss with them if they agree uh, to uh, need to resume very quickly after surgery. I just like a people to treat by MRI session. But in this case, by case, it's not every case. Thank you, Iti. I saw also Ben. Hello, Ben. Welcome. Is there? Hello, Alberto. Nice Hi. to meet you. And hello, Professor Kato. Nice to meet you. So uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ichi, for your excellent presentation. So um, uh, in Hong Kong, some of our centers also start doing the uh, MMA embolization for the, uh, for the chronic subdural. I mean, the, the, main, the main indication for them would be those uh, who are not um, uh, medically fit for an uh, operation and also for those uh, recurrent cases. But uh, we, do, um, uh, we do encounter some uh, recurrent cases uh, even though after the MMA embolization. So I, I mean, in your series, uh, uh, you have uh, excellent results. So, um, so can you share uh, some of the tips during the embolization? So I, I saw you have, um, uh, uh, you have uh, the NGO uh, showing, uh, uh, sometimes you will um, uh, embolize the whole uh, MMA or, or would you, uh, would you uh, choose the anterior branch or posterior branch or MMA based on the CT scan of the uh, the chronic subdural? Uh, thank you for your uh, uh, question. Uh, this is uh, the interesting question be because uh, if if we we uh, reveal about the the location of the the, the, the thickness of the capsule of the chronic subdural hematoma, we can predict uh, about the branch of the middle mental artery. But, but in the practice time, uh, the branch of middle mental artery for the digital branch is not too dangerous if we embolize. And uh, this branch is not function to, to, uh, to, to another, like uh, the important function, only supply the dura. So, we in 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 my practice, I embolize uh, frontal band of and parietal band together, like uh, in main trunk. But uh, sometimes the embolic embolic material have the retrograde to the foramen spinosum. This is the the, the the angle for this is a very dangerous because it's a cause of a facial palsy. So yes. I recommend to embolize both band of the frontal and parietal band. As we can. Yes, I think uh, I think uh, you're absolutely right. The branch to the facial left uh, is uh, very important, although it's not very commonly seen for the this and the Moses the chosel branch. Mm -hmm. And uh, I I I I wonder whether the whether the panel has some experience that because sometimes when we do a chronic subdural burr hole surgery. So we do, I, I do encounter the MMA myself, and sometimes I would uh, coagulate, uh, coagulate the MMA as well. So, uh, so my experience is that uh, the, uh, for those cases with the MMA cauterized, uh, they do, do not uh, recur. I think uh, this probably uh, add to the value of the MMA embolization. Thank you. Thank I have you. so uh, Dr. Iti. Yes. I have one question. Uh, the, the this was a very wonderful presentation, and uh, I thought that uh, 
uh, was, was there any comparison between uh, your uh, series of bar hole evacuation only and uh, MMA embolization cases? What was the uh, was there significant difference? Like after doing only bar hole evacuation and uh, the there was resolution of chronic uh, subdural hematoma and in those cases which you did uh, middle meningeal artery embolization. I saw that there was complete re resolution in all 45 cases. So the result was 100%. But uh, those patients who underwent only bar hole evacuation, uh, what was the percentage of uh, complete resolution? Uh, right, that, that you mean about the uh, comparing between the embolization and surgery? And only bar hole evacuation. Oh, bar hole, okay, thank, thank you. Uh, because uh, in my theory, I uh, just like uh, uh, in some time I have a, a bias to select the patient because uh, once I I saw about the CT scan, they have mm -hmm. like a only simple capsule of the chronic subdural hematoma. Maybe yeah. I just uh, choose the patient to perform burho with a uh, uh, drainage because. Uh, uh, if a simple capsule does mean they have only one state of the chronic subdural hematoma, no capsule, you can perform maybe no recurrence after burho. But in some cases, if you have the thickness of the chronic subdural hematoma and they have multi state of the blood, mm -hmm. I recommend we should inject the contrast media after CT scan. Okay, if we inject the contrast. A CT band uh, with contrast. Maybe you can see about the another layer mm -hmm. on the capsule. Okay. If in this group of patients, this is really strongly suggestion to perform MMA embolization okay. because it's very uh, like a very good result because the MMA can support many rare of the chronic subdural hematoma. Yeah, mm -hmm. I I should in this patient every patient if they uh, will not have increased nuclear pressure symptom I yeah. perform for the first treatment by embolization. Yeah. It's very yeah. good now. Yeah, that, that's good. And uh, there is one more question that uh, after doing MMA embolization, did you use uh, steroid or uh, overhydration to expand brain uh, to relieve the symptoms or to get uh, better results? Thank you. This is a uh, very, very regular. Uh, many doctors in, 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 in my country, I accept. Like uh, in some doctor, like uh, give dexamethasone if uh, they, they, they saw about like uh, in this patient. But for in, in my case, because I believe the effective of the embolization, I want to challenge in my treatment. I, did, I, never, I never give a steroid in this patient, but I just keep normal volumic status of the patient. It's like not too much hydration or dehydration, but mm -hmm. I, I think it's a really good outcome. Yeah. Thank you. And um, I, I, this, this is question to all that, uh, do you use dexamethasone? Because I personally use it uh, mm -hmm. in those cases which I prefer conservative treatment. And also after doing uh, bar hole evacuation, I use it for at least 10 days. Uh, mm. to resolve the inflammatory cascade as per uh, books and some articles. <laughs> so what's your policy? Like uh, Alberto Beng, what's your policy? Well, I use, uh, uh, I use uh, uh, steroids uh, in those cases uh, uh, which I judge uh, uh, not uh, okay for surgery. Uh, I mean, those cases I, I want to, I try to avoid surgery. Uh, because they don't have major symptoms, uh, you know, they have maybe minor symptoms. I try with steroids. Uh, yes, I know it's controversial. Uh, mm -hmm. ETHI showed during his presentation. Uh, well, you know, there is a number of uh, studies uh, about drugs uh, for chronic subdurals. Uh, I read a paper a few years ago about uh, tranexamic acid, uh, which seems to be actually uh, very effective based on the patients uh, published in this paper. 
Uh, I don't know if any of you have experience uh, with tranexamic acid. I don't have, but for dexamethasone, I use uh, in those cases. Uh, Postoperatively, no, uh, we don't use. If uh, we perform a bar hole uh, evacuation, uh, we avoid uh, uh, steroids. Ben, you have uh, raised hand. Yes, uh, so uh, to uh, address uh, the question about the steel, so uh, I, uh, in, in my center, we do, we do uh, use uh, uh, steroid for a period of time. And uh, the, uh, the main concern of the steroid is, uh, is, is complication. So uh, for those cases that um, uh, at, that peri at that period of time, uh, previously we use a steroid and um, and uh, and seems that uh, the effect of the steroids uh, is not uh, so good uh, in our experience. So on the other hand, and uh, we trying to uh, switch to another, uh, we try to switch to using the antipalate, uh, the lipid lowering agent, uh, the so called. Uh, we are actually running a. a a big scale study in Hong Kong uh, to see the effect of the of the lipid lowering agent uh, to see whether uh, it works because in some uh, literatures that uh, there is um, it seems that the efficacy of the of the lipid lowering agent like so called is uh, similar to steroids which the so called has a much uh, less side effect and uh, that's why we are uh, running a uh, study on it. So uh, another question uh, for uh, uh, for Professor Et is that I I wonder in your cases of the bilateral chronic subdural what are the causes is there any cases of the intracranial hypotension and uh, do you have experience in in using the MMA embolization uh, in cases with intracranial hypotension with a chronic subdural hematoma? Uh, now I uh. I don't have because uh, I just like a uh, like a scary <laughs> when 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 a patient have uh, some deterioration, but uh, I I like uh, my protocol didn't in, include for the in 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 intracranial patient to treatment in this technique. Yeah, Thank but uh, may may I I ask uh, Doctor Alberto about the, the practice. Once uh, you see about the, like a, the cap, capsule during operation, you, mm. did you have any experience to remove about the capsule totally for prevention of the recurrent, like uh, in this case? Yeah, I, uh, well, of course, uh, through a, a simple bar hole, although I enlarged it a little bit during surgery, uh, we used to say like uh, two euros coin. I don't know in in uh, in your country how big coins are, but that's the size. Of course, uh, I cannot remove completely uh, the parietal uh, uh, capsule. I remove as much as I can see, uh, but I cannot remove it completely. Uh, if in those cases uh, when I have a, a recurrence of the chronic subdural, maybe two recurrences. Okay, in those cases, we do a, a craniotomy, uh, not so big, but of course, larger than just a bar hole. And we remove as much as we can of the capsule. This is our policy now, yes. I don't know about uh, uh, the other colleagues here. Uh Alberto, wh where, where do you make craniotomy? Like it's a small craniotomy. What site do you prefer? Because uh, same policy I follow in those cases, but I have one particular area which where I do four into four centimeter size craniotomy. So what site do you prefer? Size, I think, uh, yeah, three, four centimeters diameter. And uh, location, is it frontal, parietal? Location, of course, it depends on the on the hematoma, but usually uh, if it's in the area of the bar hole, so I just uh, enlarge the uh, you know the the incision, mm -hmm. and and starting from the bar hole, I perform the craniotomy all around. 
and uh, after doing this craniotomy and opening dura do you strip the membrane from the uh, inner membrane also not the inner membrane usually never. i don't no i don't mm -hmm. touch the inner membrane never i think uh, the outer membrane uh, must be removed if possible inner membrane uh, from at least from the literature from the major literature uh, it's uh, I would say it got, does not give you so much in terms of prognosis and results, and uh, it gives you higher risks of brain damage or uh, even CSF leakage. So I don't, I never touch the inner membrane. Of course, I, I want to be sure that what I can see at the bottom of the hematoma is really the inner membrane, because sometimes you have many layers of the same chronic subdura, right? So if I can see a transparent uh, layer, which is actually the inner layer, I don't touch. So I, I must see the brain. That's yeah. the point. I must see. If I don't see the brain, I open. I want to see the brain. Yes. Um, the yeah, yes, yeah. Yes. Please Go continue. Please. No, no, I finished. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was mentioning that this this was important point because sometimes stripping the membrane uh, they are the cause of CSF leak and right. Uh, right. The, the result changes that results into meningitis and what I prefer is I do hydro dissection to remove the inner side membrane and hydro dissection is little bit safe than the actual dissection so hmm. that we use to remove the membranes over the brain. Thank you. And what about, uh, okay, as we are talking about surgery for chronic subdural, uh, when you do a bar hole evacuation of chronic subdural, how do you treat uh, the dura matter? I mean, do you coagulate and destroy the dura matter or do you uh, open it uh, and, you know, then you, uh, uh, you uh, try to reconstruct, of course, not watertight, no need. But how do you manage? I destroy it with a bipolar cautery, use it and uh, touch it to coagulate the, uh, I cut it in cruciate manner and uh, use monopolar cautery over the dura uh, to avoid any kind of bleeding, monopolar coagulation. And after cutting this, I use bipolar cautery to uh, coagulate completely the leaflets of dura and make okay. complete hood and then open the external membrane and I see, I see. Because I try to uh, spare the dura. So I open, uh, <coughs> I open it uh, in the cruciate uh, manner, as you do. And then I suspend the margins. Mm -hmm. And I destroy only the parietal membrane of the hematoma. And then I, uh, I use the, you know, the stitches I used uh, to, uh, to open the dura to uh, close it. Not watertight, but I close. Because there is a reason why I do that. Mm -hmm. um, the reason is that it happened to me to reopen some uh, uh, patients because mm -hmm. of uh, you know recurrence, and sometimes uh, uh, I found uh, in these patients the brain uh, coming up towards the the bar hole, yeah. and it's very difficult to detach the brain cortex from uh, actually the, the muscle layer. So uh, I, I like to leave uh, a layer of protection on the mm. cortex. That's the reason why I leave the dura. That's a valid point. Maybe I, uh, I always I always tell my residents, uh, you know, dura mater uh, is called dura mater, mater, right? So you have to respect mother, your mother, mm. but also the other people's mother. So. <laughs> But, Maybe uh, I no, to, to, uh, but uh, even though you you uh, you uh, tie the knot, uh, but you still put in a drain, right? I do. Yes, yes. drain. But, you know, as I don't I don't close it uh, uh, in a watertight manner. Uh, yeah. Uh, you have enough space to leave a uh, drainage. Yes. Uh, um, uh, yeah. You use a part of galia if if there is a destruction of dura. Coming to your point, Alberto, yeah, we yeah. can part of galia also and put it uh, on the dura side, part of galia where you make. Oh, galia, you use? No, uh, with uh, because I thought that uh, 
closing dura will be difficult so we can just place a little bit oh, larger yeah, yeah. part uh, that can save that kind of damage because say uh, it happens brain comes up to the surface and it right. creates so if you don't have to open the patient again no problem probably yeah. but if uh, you have a recurrence uh, i mean it's uh, always annoying right to detach the cortex from uh, the subcutaneous tissue or muscle through the bar hole so that's the point um i yeah, it's a very interesting. Uh, actually, it's surprising how we always talk about uh, major uh, neurosurgical <laughs> pathologies, you know, mm -hmm. but when it comes to apparently simple cases like a chronic subdural, there are so many different uh, ways yes. to treat and so much to talk about. It's, uh, yes. it's interesting, right? Mm -hmm. And there is also a question in the chat uh, issue about the use of endoscope for hematoma draining. So uh, does anyone use endoscope to, uh, to drain yeah. chronic subdurals? Yeah, professor. 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 Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now that we have a, a doctor, Dr. Komatsu, he, he is a specialist of the endoscope. So if the, the hematoma, the cavity is lobulated, because so many, maybe, uh, how would I say, some acceptation. Uh, uh, I think it's good for endoscopic uh, observation. And uh, uh, so many information uh, when we do the endoscopic evacuation. And also, I just I want to ask uh, the uh, Dr. H. Mikos, so the MMA embolization, the reported since many years before, I think, but uh, uh, I think, is it uh, good for the resident case to embolize uh, by angiogram? Because uh, sometimes it's quite uh, difficult to judge. It's not good for the resident because uh, it's, it, the, the posture is not difficult, but uh, the basic knowledge, how to like your uh, awareness uh, before and during embolization, this is uh, very difficult because you need to make a decision at that time where we should go on or we should stop or we should like uh, stop the posture. It's not for resident professor because that I, I told before because in, in my opinion, this is only optional, like a, a alternative treatment from the standard treatment only. We should uh, select case in like a, have a com complicated case to treat like, like this. But uh, I don't know, maybe in the future, maybe it's have uh, like a further low of the primary treatment in, in, in some uh, patients. Yes. Thank, thank you very much. So through your lecture, I think uh, you, it has uh, so many advantages. I think uh, you should spread to many the neurosurgeons in the world, I think, in the future. Uh, I think it is uh, one of the, the best treatment for chronic, uh, recurrent, especially recurrent one. Thank, Thank you, you very much for your you. excellent uh, presentation. Congratulations. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank please. You should learn Japanese, please. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any other uh, question? Uh, Albert, maybe Dr. Adi. Dr. Adi, you want to say something? Uh, I'm, I'm here. Uh, my apologies. Yes, please, I, yes. I, 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 Hi, Adi. Hi, hi, Albert. A long time no see. Yeah, yeah, a couple of days. <laughs> uh, Alberto was a guest um, in our BAJHS Neurosurgical Symposium a couple of days ago uh, with other international neurosurgeons. And the next year, uh, hopefully, I will invite all of you to come personally um, to visit uh, my country. And I believe that you will also enjoy. Uh, regarding the... Um, uh, lecture, great lecture, Dr. Itichai. Uh, as Dr. Alberto said, there are always these um, uh, surgeries where we have a huge discussion like hydrocephalus, norm normotensive hydrocephalus, and uh, chronic subdural hematoma. Uh, my question is, um, just do you do you just ir uh, irrigate uh, with the, with the, with the saline or or ring? Some some neurosurgeons also use ringer lactate. Uh, sometimes when I have septations, I use a small urinary, a child urinary catheter. 
So I just pull it through the um, burr hole and, and as I believe I do this small fenestration. So um, that was my question. And also the other is what Dr. Ben discussed, uh, maybe uh, placing the burr hole next to the MMA would also um, do a good job if we coagulate the main branch of the MMA on the dura. So just, uh, I would love to hear your comments. Thank you. For, for in my practice, after a uh, bar hole, I just do it only sunrin to uh, like a uh, irrigation as much as possible until uh, the, the color is clear. It's had like a no extra beating. But uh, for in the septation uh, of the chronic subdural hematoma, in my practice, I uh, never try to like uh, uh, to use some catheter in the route there and uh, I, I, I just uh, extend uh, the side of kenotomy and remove as much as possible like a uh, abato. But in almost of my case, of my theory is still recurrent. <laughs> it's still recurrent. But uh, uh, at, at the time maybe I have the experience to perform only three or four times for the surgery. Mm -hmm. But the, fi the finally, I don't know what's happened, but uh, uh, the subdural hematoma like a, uh, like a, a smaller, 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 and like uh, the totally gone. But I don't know what is the, 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 the exact cause that I do many surgery or just is a natural history of the chronic subdural hematoma is can resolve by themselves, uh, by itself. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you for your answer. <clears throat> so, uh, Adi, do you want to show us some video? Uh, there was a, like, uh, which I mentioned, like very nice student performance, but we are just editing it and uh, we will have the post and the edited video, final professional video of student performance. Uh, actually, it is a situation where uninvited neurosurgeon came to our a neurosurgical symposium and then he had a case of twins uh, with the head trauma where he had to invite all of international uh, neurosurgeons. Uh, we had a professor Kato there also, we had a professor Borba, professor Imad Kanan, etc. Professor Alberti, Alberto. So uh, I believe that we will have this uh, video over today. Then I will send you professor just to see your opinion and maybe we could uh, maybe we could upload it online for ACNS web because I believe it's not seen until present day. So, um, and also these students are very interested in neurosurgery. So I believe that uh, it would maybe help also during their future career uh, that they know to do something else except neurosurgery. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You did a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Adi. I think uh, uh, we can, of course, uh, upload, right, uh, in the ACNS website, hopefully, and maybe we can uh, also uh, share this video during the next uh, Alumni Association webinar uh, next month, Adi, if you agree. Okay. Okay, mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. Maybe I can. Right at the end of the, of the webinar, of next webinar, we can, uh, we can uh, uh, see the video and share it. Okay, so for next webinar, we will plan it. But yes. in the meantime, I will, I will send to Professor Kato and to Dr. Raja, so you can uh, also discuss about uh, feasibility of the video upload. Thank you. Right. And also, and also Professor uh, Kato, I think we can do, uh, we should do our best for helping the education uh, of uh, these countries, in particular Bosnia. Uh, I have seen enthusiastic young uh, colleagues and students. I'm sure it is the same also in many other countries, but uh, we discussed, I remember, Professor Cato, how we can help. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, also in some European countries, I am in Europe, uh, so of course uh, I'm closer uh, to some countries. I think we should really do the best because uh, there are many, many young people who uh, are eager to, to learn and to, and to uh, grow, so that's very good. Yeah, I think we can invite such a uh, uh, these uh, young doctors. We can invite for our web, our webinar. I think. Absolutely. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. <clears throat>
Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Cato and Professor Alberto. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Iti, for wonderful presentation and uh, for a uh, very nice discussion, right? Uh, I, I want to commend uh, Iti Chai Sakarun Chai because uh, he is a neurosurgeon, but he wanted to learn more and uh, he uh, underwent a path uh, with uh, education on endovascular to become hybrid neurosurgeon. I think uh, this is very important nowadays. So thank you, Iti. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. And uh, Professor uh, Yoko Kato, do you want to say some final uh, remarks uh, to this webinar? Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, Dr. Iti's uh, presentation was excellent, uh, including of the slides. Uh, that we learned a lot about how we can make uh, the beautiful slides itself. Uh, I, I think uh, many things uh, when we present the paper, I think. So maybe the, your, your paper, I think uh, you should uh, we, we can invite our SNS uh, the webinar in the future. Thank you. So uh, thank you so much. That we had a very nice uh, 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 alumni uh, uh, webinar, and also that we have a uh, not big um, funds of the uh, alumni association.